This is supposed to be a really big year for Japan, um, of course, with the return of the Olympic Games, the Paralympic Games to Tokyo this summer. And for a while there, it really looked like the country would actually be able to escape sort of the global trends and the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, numbers are very, very low for a long time. Um, despite the Diamond Princess a ship that had docked in Japan, uh, there was little community transmission um, in the country. There were no severe lockdown measures in place. Um, but of course, as you're all aware, the situation has changed over the last weeks. Um, the Olympic Games had to be postponed and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has declared a national emergency over the pandemic. Um, beyond the current crisis, though, um, there are larger shifts in Japan, both at home and abroad, that are transforming the country um, and also the role that it can play uh, today and tomorrow in the region and the world. And I could really think of no better person to discuss this with uh, and these changes than uh, Tomohiko Taniguchi, who is joining us today from Japan, from his home in Tokyo. Thank you very much. He is a special advisor to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and a professor for international political economy and Japanese diplomacy at Keio University. He spent 20 years at Nikkei Business Magazine, including a stint as their London correspondent. In 2005, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as Deputy Press Secretary and now has served as a special advisor um, and foreign policy speechwriter for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for the last few years. Professor Taniguchi, thank you very, very much for joining us uh, this morning. Um, before we start the conversation, I do want to remind everybody dialing in here on Zoom uh, that you have the ability to ask questions. You can do so by using the Q&A function that is located at the bottom of your screen. You can click it and type a question and we will see it and we'll try to get to as many of those um, in the second half of the conversation. Um, I do also want to take a quick moment to um, talk about the outline of today. Um, so very roughly, we have uh, today's conversation it will be in three parts. Uh, we will first spend a little bit of time talking about the response to coronavirus and to postponed Olympic Games and what that means for the country. Um, and then we will address Japan's role in the region mostly and also the world at large in the years to come. And finally, we'll talk about um, economic transformation and reforms um, in Japan itself towards the end um, of the hour. So, um, without further ado, Professor Taniguchi, thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nico, for having me, first and foremost. And uh, I'd be happy to address those questions. And later on, I'd be uh, uh, more than delighted to answer whatever questions you might have. As was introduced, I've been working with the Japanese Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe, for the last seven plus years as his primary foreign policy speechwriter. I'm not writing anything for his domestic policies, but when it comes to foreign policy, I've been writing uh, many uh, speeches myself for him. Um, and um, as anyone else, I've been very much worried about the spread of um, coronavirus and the pandemic um, across the globe, but also uh, more than anything else in Japan. As was said, uh, Japan is undergoing the state of emergency period uh, for about two weeks. And last week, the declaration, ha declaration was made to cover the entire country. And people across the country are now being urged to stay at home. And the goal set by the government uh, is to say that the number of people walking about in major cities must be reduced by at least 70% and possibly by 80%. The aim here is to uh, contain the spread of pandemic as soon as possible. Japan, as a large nation, has been performing uh, comparatively, relatively well with the number of death tolls still remaining in the neighborhood of 240 50 out of um, a huge uh, number of people living in this country. Um, so, um, so far, so good. That's what I can say. So far, so good. Uh, and in two weeks time, uh, hopefully we will be having uh, a time to celebrate that J Japan had passed the worst period. Uh, about the Olympic Games, um, 
it was no longer something that Tokyo was able to choose. And it was in the sure hands of the organizing members of the um, Lausanne, Switzerland-based International Olympic Committee. Given the huge complexity and the number of stakeholders involved in having Olympic Games, um, Tokyo uh, was able to say its own uh, opinions, of course, to Lausanne, but ultimately Lausanne-based IOC was the decision-making body. And Lausanne, uh, under the IOC, had to pay very, very close attention to other nations where uh, the athletes cannot train themselves. So given these situations, um, I don't think um, Tokyo was able to host the games anyway. The hope is uh, next year, July 2021, uh, not only the um, Japanese people, but also people from all over the world could celebrate uh, not just the opening of the great games, but also uh, the fact that they will have uh, survived this horrific pandemic. Uh, that's it uh, for the moment, Nico. Thank you. Thank you very much already. Um, I think you've given us a great overview of, of sort of the current situation and how, how Japan is responding. Um, let's stay with the Olympic Games for a minute. Obviously, the economic cost of just postponing them for a year is significant. The economic cost would, would rise, of course, much further were they to be postponed for another year or even uh, you know, be canceled totally. Talk a little bit, if you can, also about the political and social impact of that decision. So this is obviously something that Tokyo as a city, but really also Japan as a nation has been preparing for and has been looking forward to for a, a number of years. Uh, I remember when I was there in 2018, there was already a significant sort of buzz underway for these Olympic Games. So how does that change, if you want, the mood in the country, the fact that this large celebration, this large global celebration now um, had to be had to be postponed. Let's just compare two scenarios, if you like. One being that Tokyo 2020 uh, is going to be postponed, but nonetheless, uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be held. The second scenario is an outright cancellation, and if the second scenario uh, were to materialize that would have caused even more tremendous damage both to japan's economy for sure but uh, even more substantially importantly to the national psyche uh, especially among the young people because the uh, younger generations in japan are looking at their contemporary athletes training very much hard uh, focusing their attention solely and single-mindedly on these great games. And uh, so you will hear a massive uh, sigh of disappointment if indeed games couldn't happen anyway in 2021. So far, uh, we remain very much hopeful. I, I think uh, people across the, across the country remain hopeful that uh, these games, both Olympics and Paralympics, uh, would materialize, uh, gathering a huge crowd from all corners of the world in 2021. And if um, that actually does materialize, the damage to be done to the Japanese economy is going to be uh, minimal, uh, to say, uh, if I may say so. But an outright cancellation would uh, cause uh, tremendous damage, even more so than otherwise. Now, um, the uh, all right. Uh, let, let's uh, let's stop uh, stop for the moment. One, I think, effect that we're already seeing um, as a result of this this pandemic is an, is an acceleration and really a, a deterioration of the U.S. China relationship, which right now arguably is the the most important or one of the most important bilateral uh, country relationships on the planet. Um, and as many other countries, Japan is facing this dilemma of 
managing relationships with both those countries while the bilateral relationship between the two um, is deteriorating. Obviously, Japan is a historically close ally of the US, um, but also um, you know, uh, the second largest economy um, in Asia after China. So how does Japan manage this balance between keeping up as good relations as possible with two countries that are moving more and more towards sort of the polar ends of the spectrum? First, um, people in the world are becoming very much angry about the pandemic and uh, understandably so countries like spain italy and indeed the united states people are looking at one body bag after another and this is still the 21st century no one actually thought that in this century we would be looking at such a horrendous picture and the fact remains that the virus was first detected in Wuhan, China. And so um, I understand that there is a growing anger about that across the world. But let's stay calm and let's concentrate our willpower, scientific capabilities, and um, uh, our determinations to let us survive this pandemic. And after we will have survived this pandemic, uh, let's just hope that the normal relationships should resume among the nations and between the United States and China. Uh, as for Japan, as for Tokyo's government under Shinzo Abe, uh, you, could, uh, you could say that uh, no nasty remark and finger pointing sort of exercise has been done by the Japanese government about anyone, including China. And so uh, we are prepared to uh, go back to normal when things have settled finally. Can you talk a little bit maybe, um, this is obviously, a part of this about the relationship between Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and, and Chinese President Xi. Um, of course, they have known each other for a while. Um, I know that uh, a state visit had actually been planned uh, this month in April and had to be postponed. So how would you assess the current sort of relationship, not just between the two countries, but between the two leaders? And do you think it has changed over recent years as both leaders have sort of you know, stayed, in their, um, stayed in their respective posts? Um, I wouldn't call the relationship between the two leaders, one between soulmates, one between very close friends, uh, but uh, no one could lead Japan uh, without having a manageable, uh, good relationship with its biggest neighbor biggest neighbor being geographically, uh, but also economically speaking. Uh, Japan's economic stakes uh, are found much in Japan. Uh, so um, it is not so much what sort of relationship she and Abe have at the moment as what sort of relationship both countries, the uh, People's Republic of China and Japan ought to have now and in the future. But let's not forget the uh, national identity, if I may call it that way, for Japan now and in long, long decades to come is one that is maritime by nature. Maritime identity shapes Japan. And as such, its natural partners uh, have been and will continue to be such maritime democratic nations as the United States, Australia, and um, down the road more and more, India. And that being Japan's national identity and that much, I don't think can change uh, either uh, under Shinzo Abe or under whoever else uh, who would lead Japan in the future. 
and there you've already mentioned the uh, what's, what's sometimes referred to as the quads, the quadrilateral alliance between the US, Japan, Australia, and India. And I do want to come back to this, especially the, the India relationship. Um, but let's stay with the US and, and the bilateral relationship between Japan and the US for just a second. Um, it seems now, and, and maybe that will change depending on who the occupant of the White House is come November, but it does seem generally that there is a trend in the US towards less global engagement, towards a little bit of a, a retreat um, uh, towards its own shores um, and maybe to less engagement in the region um, than it did previously. At the same time, of course, you have um, uh, China that is still growing, that is becoming more assertive um, in the region. Do you see this also perhaps as an opportunity for Japan to you know, develop its own role in the region and become a little bit of a counterbalance to China um, as the US is slowly retreating? So can Japan sort of step in and fill the void that the US is leaving in the region? For many decades after the end of the Second World War, Japan was on the receiving end and nothing else of the security provided solely by the United States. And um, in the 1980s, gradually Japan stepped out of its mold and began working more closely with the United States to significantly contain the Vladivostok-based strategic submarine fleet under the USSR. That was what Japan did with the United States in the 1980s and early 19, uh, 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 w before the Soviet regime collapsed. Um, now it is incumbent upon Tokyo's government, for now Tokyo being uh, led by Shinzo Abe, but in the future, whoever takes office, it is incumbent upon Tokyo's government to help secure the engagement and commitment of the United States in the Indo-Pacific region. You may, you may ask, you may ask, what if the United States becomes such and such, what would Japan do? I think that's a legitimate enough question to be asked all the time. But for a nation's leader, such as Shinzo Abe, the question uh, is rather something like, uh, what could Japan do more? to help stabilize the Pacific region. After all, uh, countries such as Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam uh, certainly uh, need to have a balancing power. Uh, and that balancing power traditionally has been the United States and uh, they uh, may or may not like the current regime of the United States but when it comes to the fact that the United States still maintains the largest ever naval power the humans have ever had, and its, uh, its regime being transparent and democratic, and uh, the media freedom is something that you could count on in the United States. So the presence of the United States still is being desired across the Indo-Pacific region. And I think uh, one of the roles that Japan should and could play down the road is to help stabilize the presence of the United States. Let's maybe talk about one area where I think, you know, sort of the, the role of Japan as a, as a regional balancing power, if you want, is already quite apparent, and that is the role of infrastructure investment. So, of course, uh, we have talked for years very extensively about China's Belt and Road Initiative, which seeks, among many other things, to help build infrastructure um, in Asian countries and, and increasingly also other places around the world. And what's interesting to me is that what's very often overlooked, and, and actually I, I was not aware of um, until quite recently, is that um, Japan has had essentially its own Belt and Road for years. It just doesn't talk about it quite as much, maybe, or it doesn't get as much attention uh, as Belt and Road. Um, but the uh, fact remains that Japan is very active in infrastructure investment in the region. In some places, actually a larger investor in infrastructure than China is still. So uh, talk a little bit about, if you can, about the strategy uh, that Japan has behind 
um, being such an active investor in infrastructure in the region? How does it try to go about it? What's also, you know, how does it try to distinguish itself from the Belt and Road? What is its relationship to the Belt and Road um, as it goes about as it goes about asking um, uh, making making these investments? Well, it's no surprise that you um, have heard very little about Japan's uh, infrastructure development uh, programs and exercises that the country has conducted in um, uh, African nations and so on, uh, because Tokyo is far from branding savvy. Um, and actually there is no brand like Belt and Road um, under the possession of the uh, Japanese government. That said, there is a uh, important and uh, substantial difference between what China is attempting to do, what the Japanese are attempting to do. And that comes down to the fact that uh, no state owned enterprise is engaged in Japan's infrastructure build up projects in the Indian Ocean region and in African nations. It is, um, it is uh, solely the private entities, private companies that must be engaged. And for those private companies to be able to get engaged in building dams and ports and airports and roads, what is most important is accountability with which they could explain what they're doing to their shareholders, transparent transparency and financial bankability. And as a result, the sustainability of the projects. And uh, Japan's position is not so much different from the ones held by other OECD member nations that uh, cherish the sustainability in many respects financially and socially and environmentally and so on and so forth. So call it a quality infrastru infrastructure development. And that quality infrastructure is perhaps um, what Japan coined with other nations in pursuit of um, infrastru infrastructure development. So um, last year, uh, Tokyo held in a, in, in a place called Osaka, actually, uh, the meetings of G20 nations. And prior to that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Japan also, uh, and in those uh, both occasions, the stress was put on the building of these infrastructure, in the quality infrastructures. And uh, in the G20 meetings, Beijing also agreed to subscribe to this basic notion that whenever you build infrastructures, they must be transparent in nature and they must be bankable and sustainable. So that's what uh, Japan is after. Let's talk about um, the relationship as, as we already hinted before um, of Japan with another uh, large, large power in Asia um, and that is India. Now, you, you'd mentioned a couple of times that you know, Japan's role could be and, and perhaps should be as a, as a balancing power, um, sort of a, um, a country offering, offering a little bit also of an alternative to China. And, and interestingly, we just had a conversation last week on the India-China relationship um, with, uh, with some analysts from India. Um, and they were essentially making the same point about Indians. You know, India as this sort of uh, quote unquote swing power between China and the US that can sort of, you know, sort of help keep things civil, but also can, you know, at certain times help tip the scale. So with Japan and with India, both sort of, you know, like in a position to possibly um, offer an alternative or a balance uh, to China in Asia, what is the current relationship between India and Japan? Um, seeing as, you know, there's, I, I know the relationship is close, but it could also at some point be a relationship that becomes more competitive um, in the future. Let me introduce some of the factual matters, if I may. First, India for many years has been the single largest recipient 
of Japanese aid development assistance that constitutes provision of soft loan, uh, which means that uh, loan with extremely low interest rates. And um, um, in, the, in India, the government, central government is uh, pursuing the development of industrial corridor between Delhi and Mumbai. And that's been uh, being conducted jointly by Delhi and Tokyo. And so that's second. But more importantly and interestingly, before these economic stakes gained weight, strategic ties started to gain momentum between Delhi and Tokyo. Uh, India, with its economic growth, has developed its keen sense that when it comes to safety and stability in the Indian Ocean, the largest country in the region, namely India, must and should shoulder more responsibilities. And then that was at the time when Delhi started to go and look beyond the Straits of Malacca to look further into the Pacific Ocean. And naturally, uh, Delhi found two important partners uh, that were, they were Australia and Japan. And so India's relationships uh, between these uh, countries, uh, one between Japan and India, another between Australia and India, have both been uh, advancing quite remarkably over the last decade. And then under Narendra Modi, who was at one point banned from entering into the United States, uh, is enjoying a good relationship with um, uh, the United States government and especially with Donald Trump, the United States president. And so uh, the US-India relationship has gone north. Uh, so that being the case, uh, Japan and India uh, have gotten very, very close in many respects. And indeed that uh, improved relationship has been bolstered, bolstered even further by extremely uh, good relationship between the two individual leaders of Narendra Modi and Shinzo Abe. I think some call the relationship one between really soulmates, quote, end quote. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where we are. And I think um, uh, India is undergoing um, a bit of um, uh, uh, tumultuous uh, periods in its history. Uh, but the fact remains that uh, when it comes to the track record of India's open uh, democratic elections, there is no question about it. And one should hope that India would develop its uh, healthy uh, economy and healthy governance structure. And I think uh, Japan is um, very much ready to work further with uh, India for that direction as well. I see that there are many, many questions being already submitted by the audience. I want to make sure we have uh, we have some time towards the end to to answer as many of them as possible. Let's move on maybe a little bit towards uh, the, the the third topic we had for today, which is the economic transformation of um, of Japan domestically. And I want to get back to something you told me when we met um, a little over two years ago in Tokyo, when you said that the most important thing for Japan. Uh, would be that people would have hope again uh, for the future. And at time you've mentioned you know, that you, you felt like sort of a, a bottom had been reached uh, a little bit earlier after after the uh, Fukushima disaster and that sort of the outlook of people um, was more hopeful again. Uh, two years on, what's your assessment? So how hopeful um, have people in Japan been maybe you know, prior to the coronavirus crisis and are you already seeing a change in that attitude now that we're sort of in this crisis, but still at the very beginning of it, and unsure of how it's going to turn out. Um, people are understandably, understandably very much gloomy for now, and um, 
it's uh, it's gotten harder for anyone, be it Japanese or anyone else, to have hope for the moment. But pandemic is something that uh, will go away uh, at any rate in the future. And then the question is whether Japan could boost once again hope for the future among its people, especially among its younger generations. The reason why I think hope is an important factor for Japan's economic development lies in the fact that no matter what you do, uh, either to uh, build your capital stock, either to increase your labor input, uh, or for a country such as Japan, most importantly, to improve and enhance your productivity, you must have a healthy dose of hope for investors. They must be hopeful for the future in which they put their money on. For young families, they must remain hopeful to build their families and give birth to babies and um, overall young generations must be encouraged that if they work hard they could build better future and so all combined i think hope lies at the bottom of anything else and everything and that being the case for any country, but especially for Japan at the moment, uh, one must stress even more on the importance of having hope for the future. Why? Because as you might remember, some of you might remember, Japan's financial speculative bubble collapsed way back in the early period of the 1990s. And the apex zenith of Japan's stock price index was something like 38,000 Japanese yen. But a Japanese uh, Nikkei index is being traded in the neighborhood of 20,000, even 19,000. In the interim, since 1990 and now, people have come out of their schools and entered businesses. But those people becoming late 40s and 50s, you may say now that the entire generation of the Japanese that is actually leading Japanese economy has had no growth whatsoever in their experience. And therefore their sense of self-efficacy and self-esteem equally have been uh, negatively affected. So those are the bunch of people who might say, well, we work still hard, but uh, I don't we, don't, we don't, we don't think we can expect much for the future. If you have such a mindset, I think it's very much imp uh, it, difficult for you to encourage to spend more on productivity, capital stock, and on building families. So um, in that sense, I continue to stress that uh, hope matters more than anything else. And let's maybe stay a little bit in this lane and talk about more concretely you know, sort of the economic policy in Japan. And of course, you know, then when, when we do that, uh, we talk about a set um, of, of guidelines, or, or sometimes they're referred to as arrows of, uh, under the term of Abenomics, um, so the, the economic policy guidelines if you wish, of uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Um, and I want to quickly remind people, uh, they're, sometimes, they're sometimes phrased a little bit differently, but you know, generally those are the, 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 the three arrows, um, aggressive monetary policy, uh, fiscal flexibility, fiscal stimulus, um, and then of course structural, social, economic um, reforms. And uh, this is a question that uh, several people from the audience have sent me and I did actually plan to call on somebody to ask it, but it turns out that technically I cannot ask them. I, I cannot give them the opportunity to speak. So I apologize for that. I will ask the question in their stead. Um, 
so it, it seems that out of these three arrows, one and two, um, monetary policy, fiscal fiscal stimulus, you know, have been have been addressed and, and, and forcefully used. Um, but there is more of a question around, you know, sort of the the, the breadth and also efficacy of uh, structural reform. So. How, how, how would you how would you see that first point sort of where where are we or where is the Abe government um, you know with regards to what it had planned in reforms um, and, and what it was actually able to put in place so is is, is Japan on track with regards to these reforms or is it lagging behind and what needs to be done to actually achieve the goals set out um, by Prime Minister Abe? Well, because of the pandemic, the one Q, two Q, three Q. Uh, economic performance of the country would be very, very bad for sure. Uh, that being said, uh, let me just uh, introduce some of the facts first, starting from the um, social welfare uh, entitlement cost that Japan uh, is uh, with. Um, let's look at the gross total amount of spending spent for providing social welfare programs that cover everything from child care to elderly care. The amount is at the moment in Japanese yen, 120 trillion. 100 trillion Japanese yen can be translated into Euro and US dollars and you can do that easily but this amount, 120 Japanese yen, is almost as much as, listen to me, US defense budget, Chinese defense budget, Russia's, France's, and Saudi Arabia's defense budget all put together. See, this is not something uh, that the Japanese government covers. It is being covered both by the government and the private sectors and the individuals. But if you look at the gross total of the amount spent for a single purpose of providing uh, uh, welfare, social welfare, uh, that's a huge astronomic number. Second, if you look at the Japanese annual budget that is growing year on year, and uh, that is uh, close to, for now, 105 trillion yen or something like that. And that sounds to be, again, a huge amount, but 70, uh, uh, 73% of the total annual uh, budget is being spent for only three purposes, to pay back government liabilities, I mean, uh, government bonds. That's number one. Number two, to cover social welfare costs. Again, a familiar matter. Third, to uh, distribute those money to the regional municipal governments. So the rest, 26, 27% is the amount of money the central government could use for developing its arsenal, armed forces, to pay uh, uh, scientists engaged in basic scientific research and to pay uh, uh, police force and firefighters and everything. The uh, education must be covered by the remainder of the budget of 26%. So in order for Japan to create a better, future growth is imperative there are some in japan as in many other countries who would say we don't need growth anymore you know um it's it's um uh, it's even more harmful so let's just uh, pause for a moment and uh ask for no growth um i don't actually subscribe to that idea because you couldn't pay your police force, you couldn't pay firefighters, you couldn't pay much amount, amount of money on basic scientific research. And that will be an invitation for Japan to become even poorer. Uh, 
Um, so the question comes down to how you could generate growth. And uh, uh, it is uh, one way to make the society more inclusive. And that's, uh, that's an important ingredient for the third arrow of socioeconomic structural change. And I can tell you, despite the fact that Japan has lost its working age population rather substantially over the last 10 years, um, not an equal amount of, num not an equal number of people, but uh, a substantial number of people uh, have been offset by number one, uh, women coming back to the workplace more and more. And those elderly have chosen to stay in the job market. So combined, um, Japan has minimized the damage to be done by the shrinking population to the uh, economy. And with the uh, increase of the number of women working in the society, you need to have more and more and even more arrangements that make it easier for the families, women and men, to uh, cut a good balance between the work engagement and the family. And so the society must be inclusive. By inclusive, it means that Japan should embrace those people coming from abroad to seek job opportunities. And Japan's government chose to do that uh, a couple of years ago. And you will see that gradual increase of those people coming from Vietnam, China, the Philippines, Indonesia to Japan. Um, so, that I think is the most important ingredient for socioeconomic growth. The second factor is that with Japan becoming a member of the Pacific Wide Trade Pact, something called the TPP, and with Japan becoming an integral partner with European nations about EU Japan uh, trade and investment liberalization something we call a uh, free uh, 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 economic partnership agreement, EPA, uh, Japan's agricultural industry, uh, previously a bastion of rural votes that sustained the old minded um, uh, sort of uh, conservative party uh, has shifted its gears towards making themselves more export oriented and I think it's very much striking that the rice growers in Japan uh, are selling more and more their produce uh, abroad in mm. Hong Kong, in the United States, and in uh, Europe as well. So the agrocentric conservative, um, um, uh, you know, bastion of uh, rural votes uh, has undergone a tremendous shift for very much a short period of time of uh, five, seven years. So those being, I would count uh, some of the economic and social shifts that Japan has undergone for the last uh, several years. Thank you very much. And let me, because there's so many questions from the audience, so let's see that we can um, answer, answer some of them in the time that we have remaining. I want to start with two that are actually follow-up questions to things that you had mentioned um, in your answer just now. Um, the first one is about the impact of foreign labor uh, to counter Japan's demographic aging. So uh, briefly, maybe do you talk about how is allowing more uh, foreign labor into the country, um, relaxing maybe some of these restrictions. How important is that as an as an element of the sort of the, the big transition structural reforms that you have just uh, been talking about? All right. Uh, the first priority must be that uh, you must first and foremost encourage your own people, the Japanese people, to expect more for the future. Uh, if indeed you have a young generation that expects very little for their own future, um, it's, um, it's, it does not work. It's going to make Japan poorer. Uh, but when it comes to 
the sectors that are undergoing a huge uh, a shortage of uh, uh, labor, uh, Japan opened for the first time its doors towards those people seeking uh, simple labor opportunities. And that distinguished the decision from the previous ones equally um, attempted by the Japanese government to invite more to make it simple, PhD holders. Uh, Japan has a, a point system similar to the ones that you can find in countries such as the UK. If you have assumed, if, uh, if you have amassed points, uh, uh, the number of which being enough uh, should lead you to uh, get uh, Japan's version of green card, i.e. permanent residency visa. And the decision was taken several years ago under Shinzo Abe to make it as short as possible. So for now, uh, some of you could uh, pursue Japan's permanent residency visa by living in Japan for as short a period of time as one single year. Uh, it's not going to change so much drastically and dramatically Japan as a country. After all, you're talking about a country where, you know, the written history dates back to fifth century and so on and so forth. And uh, those old poems um, sang in the seventh century are still being recited by high school students. So uh, continuity and let's say consistency of its um, civilization culture I think defines what Japan is about still. And I can tell you that Japan is not going to be like uh, Australia, Israel, uh, the United States, Canada, a true immigrant society. But nonetheless, you must um, cherish more, not less, people coming from abroad to make Japan more robust as an economy and make Japan as a more fruitful ground where you could pursue innovations. After all, innovations must be open. And in order, for, in order for you to pursue open innovation, you must have as diversified a um, society as possible. So um, that's the sort of context in which I argue the importance of um, inviting people from abroad. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to another audience question, which in its entirety just reads, Oh, and I think that's kind of telling. So the question just reads, relationship to Japan, South Korea, question mark. And of course, this is um, a bilateral relationship that we hadn't covered before, but one that is important. It's also complicated and, and fraught with conflict. Um, talk a little bit, if you can, briefly about where you see this relationship now. There has been some, there have been some disputes um, a while ago. It's quieted down a, a bit, it seems, since then. So how would you assess the Japan-South Korea relationship um, and where do you see it going in, in, in the next few years? I think Seoul and Tokyo must manage the bilateral relationship that must be a linchpin for the security, safety, and prosperity for this corner of the world. Uh, indeed, um, over the last couple of hours, we've been hearing news such that, that says that uh, Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, is seriously ill. And no one can tell whether this is true or not, but that tells us all one single most important thing, that when it comes to readying themselves for the turbulence ahead, you need to have good relationship between South Korea and Japan. That much should go without um, explanation. And I think um, Moon government and Japan, uh, after this corona pandemic has uh, been somehow overcome, should resume good dialogue between the two nations. Um, people to people relationships have more or less been all right. For instance, uh, 
uh, at any university on each campus, you see uh, a big number of Korean, South Korean, I mean, students working with their Japanese counterparts in Japan and vice versa. I work for uh, the oldest private university in Japan, the name of which is Keio. Uh, but I know that uh, uh, a big number of uh, undergrad students from Keio are going annually to the ROK. So um, uh, that is uh, the situation I can describe about. Uh, bottom line is, uh, if you want to dance, uh, you need two partners. Let's move on to, to another question from the audience that I really liked, um, um, which is about your explanation for the continuing popularity of Prime Minister Abe. Um, and uh, the person who asked the question goes on to point out, which I think is, is, is interesting and true, that the majority of the population in Japan, according to polls, um, opposes one of Prime Minister Abe's policy goals, which is the, um, the, the changing of Article 9 in, in the Japanese constitution. So there is uh, perhaps disagreement between the Prime Minister and, and the majority of the population on this very central issue, um, yet that does not seem to affect his, his popularity. So what, in your view, um, that's the question here, is the secret um, of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's political longevity, which is also unusual um, if you look at sort of the political history of Japan before he, uh, before he became Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Abe works on the fifth floor of the Prime Minister's official uh, building, and I work on the fourth floor. And I always uh, look actually literally up to the fifth floor to see what's going on and uh, what uh, he is especially working on. And I can tell you two things. One, personal matters, and two, more structural matters. One being that he is the hardest working prime minister ever remembered by anyone in Japan at the moment. He works harder than almost anyone else. Um, and uh, that much has been uh, understood uh, by an increasing number of people in Japan. Second, uh, this is my own hypothesis but uh, I should say people are aware that now is the least opportune time for Japan to have something called a revolving door prime minister who can stay in office for a short period of time to address some of the fundamental economic illnesses uh, to address some of the structural challenges such as population and to address an increasingly complex external environment, you need continuity and you need, if possible, consistency and commitment. And my own um, view is that Shinzo Abe has been able to provide the nation with these C's, con continuity, consistency, and commitment. And I think that much, I would say, has been, of course, this is a contested argument, but that much has been understood by the populace that have continued to give majority, election after election, as, ma as many times as seven times to the prime minister. Um, let's move on to one question um, that I really, really like. So you are, um, of course, concerning yourself with foreign policy and, and with that also, to a certain extent, with Japan's image abroad. Um, and, and one question here from the audience kind of flips this around, which is interesting, um, and kind of asks about Japan's image, um, which is how, how, people, how people see, uh, see Japan in, 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 um, in other countries. The question is, very broadly, and maybe you can just you know, bring up one or two examples. Um, what are we, um, I guess we as in the rest of the world, the West, misunderstanding about Japan? So what are some of the things you would love for people around the world to understand better about your country? Um, I've got a number of things to do myself for Japan to boost its uh, image 
to external world. Uh, if you urge me to say those things, I would be happy to do that. But um, at the bottom of my heart, I think Japan is doing okay. Um, it's not in major headlines anymore in daily newspapers. I think China is dominating uh, news headlines daily. Is it good or bad? Uh, you may say uh, good or bad, but um, uh, poll after poll taken in many countries indicate that uh, Japan is good, quote unquote, the definition of which varies, but good. And uh, uh, Japan appears uh, on the lead table of 10 uh, appreciated countries. And that's the fact. And when it comes to cultural ingredients, history, the longevity of which, and literature from ancient times to the contemporary and food and cuisine and some of the mystified institutions such as the imperial family and sport events. Last year was very, very fortunate for Japan because it hosted Rugby World Cup and many, many people thought that the Tokyo Japan hosted World Cup was among the best. And so combined, uh, you get um, an enough amount of ingredients with which you could associate yourself with Japan. So uh, I think as one living in Japan, I'm telling myself, you should not expect more. You got enough, more, more than most others. So um, that's my answer to your question. Thank you. So we're almost out of time. So let me end with one question um, that was sent to me by somebody uh, uh, from among our members uh, that I really, really liked. Obviously, Japan has the very unfortunate historic experience of having to rebuild the country after, after the Second World War and after the, um, the nuclear bombings. Um, and, you know, I, I dare say it did so very successfully. So as we are already preparing off, hopefully not quite to that extent, but at least, you know, do a certain amount of rebuilding um, of all of our societies and economies after the coronavirus pandemic um, has finally passed. What do you think it is that the world could possibly learn from Japan in doing so? Um, I don't know. Um, one must remain humble. And I don't think Japan is going to blow its horn about whether Japan has survived this pandemic well. Um, the good part of the society, if you may, if you urge me to say just one thing, is to care about other people. And certainly Japan is entering into a period where economic discrepancies are being widened rather than um, uh, getting closer. Uh, still, I think people have developed mindset to care about other people. Well, I'm uh, blowing my own horn, so let's uh, just stop here. <laughs> Um, well, I think that is an excellent point to end um, perfectly on time with your, um, and, and I do think you're absolutely right with your um, exhortation that uh, we should care about each other as we, as we move forward to this crisis. Professor Taniguchi, thank you so, so, so much for joining us today um, and for all your insights. Um, thank you, everybody, for having been here for all your questions. I do apologize we were not able to go through all of them, but I do hope we uh, we could address at least some of them. Um, it just means, Professor Taniguchi, we have to have you back um, very, very soon to answer some of these additional questions. But for now, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and we hope to see you very soon at another webcast. Thank you for having me again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.